Pat Basili and Transformation Talk Radio. Rituals are the foundation pulling us together, but it takes a community to support the rituals we need throughout our lives. Welcome to the journey of finding your community. Learn the knowledge of generations and how it applies to your everyday life. Tune in for an unconventional perspective on ancient wisdom and how it can change your life right now. I will tell you how to navigate this fast changing world with the power of the gifts you already have. Living your gifts with me, Susan Hopp, Ancient Applications for Modern Times starts now. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Living Your Gifts, Ancient Applications for Modern Times. I'm your host, Susan Hopp, and I welcome you today and invite you to join me second Wednesday of every month as we discuss topics to help you find your gifts in your community. As many of you know, the last time a book radically changed my life was 20 years ago when I discovered Sabon Fusome's book, Spirit of Intimacy and Welcoming Spirit Home. Reading those books energetically changed me and awakened parts of me that had gone to sleep. And now I've had the experience again, reading today's guest book, Awareness That Heals. Robert Strzok writes profoundly about awakening to healing and offers a way to talk with yourself compassionately and lovingly to reach parts of you that you thought couldn't be reached. It also helps you help others find their healing using his language and approaches. I am so happy to welcome Robert Strzok, our guest for this hour. Robert has nearly five de decades of experience as a psychotherapist, teacher, and humanitarian. And he has developed a unique approach to communication, contemplation, and inquiry. Robert co-founded the Global Bridge Foundation, whose mission is to support the equalization of economic and social opportunity, peace, and survival of our world. Robert, what I love about your book was how much it aligns with Sabonfu's teachings. It gives readers practical strategies and alternatives to connect with how you're really feeling and move through those feelings to transform them. In fact, how I've grown since knowing you is how to deepen the rituals and how to carry them into my day-to-day -day life. Robert, what do you, why do you put such an emphasis on quality of life? Well, first of all, Susan, thanks for really inviting me on the program. It's a joy. Um, I've, I've grown to trust you at such a deep level in what you have to teach. So it's an honor to be here. I'm, I'm excited and nervous and, and, I can't wait for the people who are listening to get your wisdom on this call. I really am excited. And I think they need to know why you emphasize on the quality of life and what, what's the value, what's the real value you bring to that. Well, I want to highlight first that the fact that you include nervous is such a gift to the audience, a permission to everyone that it's natural to be nervous. It's natural to be wherever we are. And that the goal is not to change where we are, but how we respond to where we are. But you're a very un, uh, let's say, un abnormal uh, in a good way for being able to just share what you're feeling moment to moment, which is one of the things that makes me so happy to be on the show. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. So the answer to your question is, when you start to uh, counsel with people, and you give suggestions of, gee, you might want to consider being a little wiser here by being more loving or being more uh, empathic. Then you're sort of repeating the worst of what most of us receive when we have shoulds and we, and we have pressures that come from the outside and we're not really being taught to look inside as to what we really believe. Whereas when you ask somebody, what do you think would be most important for your quality of life? Then it naturally inspires them to look inside and go, hmm, what would make me feel better? What would allow me to feel like I'd be in a quality that would give me a sense of well being and that would connect to those around me? And I find that it's pretty 
similar, even though a lot of different words are used like peace or caring or empathy. And it's a big difference when they say it versus you say it to them. So I, it particularly applies to wealthy people <laughs> because wealthy people really hate being told what to do. And, you, and I have a prejudice to want to really address our world, our country, and see how endangered we are. So if I went with my own uh, tendencies, I'd probably say something like, gee, don't you think you ought to give a little bit of money to so-and-so? And I realized that that's the worst thing I could possibly do. <laughs> so it's, it pretty much has to ha happen organically uh, to someone that has some connection, some means, some free energy to discover for themselves, I really want to implement this in my life and, and really supports that free will. I mean, I, I, I think that's true. And I also think it, it's, it, it, some people don't even know that that lies within them. It, they don't even know it sits, sits in the in, inside of them. So to, to bring that forward, I, I think it, it's, it's, it's hard and it's scary for people. Yeah. And so I, I love that you do that. And I also love that you like working with wealthy people because I like working with middle middle income people. So it, it finds a nice balance for both of us. But I was thinking one of the reasons I love being supported by you is that you're authentic and you challenge me and you challenge yourself also. So you have strong feelings that it is important that spiritual teachers share their current challenges. Can you um, speak more about that? Uh, one of my very favorite topics, but I want to finish the last thing we talked about. Okay. Uh, when you talked about a lot of people being confused about where they are. And it's a very, very important but sort of subtle point that most people, when they're confused, it's like, oh, yuck. I'm confused. I want to get out of here. But if we look closely, confusion for all of our lives is like a pregnancy, is like a potential birth where I don't know whether to go this way, that way, or I don't even know how to go anyway. And if you learn to respect that and trust that, maybe at first tolerate that, and then maybe accept that, then you can afford to keep inquiring and keep asking. And the tolerance for finding the most important answers to the questions that you have is so low that, that the difficulty isn't not knowing. The difficulty is really not having the inspiration to say, oh, good, I don't know. So I have a chance to concentrate and ask for what will guide me here or what will allow me to respond to this person the best way possible. Because if we ignore not knowing, we're pretty much putting our head in, head in the sand and we're not going to grow. I mean, even just with you working with me around that, I can remember like a couple times saying to you, well, I, I don't know what I'm thinking. And I was really uncomfortable with that confusion, like, like couldn't even figure out what the confusion was about, <laughs> you know, and you kind of settled me in. I mean, one of my most favorite quotes in your book is our problem is not the confusion itself, but the rejection of confusion. And I kept like looking at like that like it's almost like a foreign language in some way but when it when it started to resonate with me then I got more settled into myself and thought like why am I being so difficult with myself if I don't even know what it is I'm being difficult about right. exactly you know? yeah and, and my really natural standard response and it feels natural now is when somebody like you um, who is such a good example of I'm just going to say wherever I am is saying, great, great, you're confused. Now you have a chance to wake something up. If you're just dealing with stuff you know all the time, you become a bit boring. Um, you know, you be, and become a bit empty. I'm not saying it doesn't feel good to feel loving for an extended period of time when we have that luxury, of course, maximally enjoy that. But that doesn't necessarily mean we're growing. When we're growing, we, we need to be confused or somehow lost and develop the ability to have a response that's a caring attitude that says, okay, now we have a chance to really 
address our confusion. Now, getting back to your other question, unless you wanted to say something else. Well, I mean, I can't. I keep thinking about this confusion because I, I do think people get stuck, stuck right there, and and that's when I, I I love that you step into this friendly mind because that that to me is one of the, like. A friendly mind? Like, why didn't I think of a friendly mind? You know, I kind of, it's kind of like it's simple, but so um, it's again, it's another foreign language. How do you go? You know, how do you talk to yourself with a friendly mind? You you use that. It, it's pretty mind blowing, actually. Um, can you can you kind of tell like how can you move from confusion or how can you even stay in the confusion with a friendly mind? Okay, I, I'll be happy to do that, and then we'll have to remember to get back to the first question because friendly friendly mind sounds like it would be a pretty simple uh, thing to learn and to practice, but actually, it's immensely subtle. Uh, on the surface, it really is having a response to whenever you're feeling something that's very difficult, and your mind is is really being preceded by a question that asks you, if I was going to really develop a wise, friendly mind while I'm going through depression or anxiety or anger or physical pain, rather than just going, damn it, I hate this, I can't stand this. When you're really guiding yourself to say, listen, how can I best take care of myself? And you take those questions to heart then gradually what will happen is guidance like, is now a good time to lie down? Is now a good time to move forward? And the only way friendly mind is really powerful is if you really generally are living your best self. Because otherwise you might say to yourself, well, I'm a good person. And actually if you aren't a good person and you say you're a good person, or I've been doing good work, or I've been helping a lot of people, and actually you've been eating bonbons for a long time, it's, it's not extremely powerful. But when you intuitively know that you've spent your life really caring about other people, and then you're caught in your own personal quagmire or quicksand, and you're sinking, then friendly mind can really come to your tremendous assistance because you have an internal ally that's 24 seven available to you, assuming you stay up at night. Um, and, and then the response can be tolerate this as much as possible. You know, you're not being sad on purpose and let yourself feel the sadness as long as you need to until you can guide yourself to care for yourself, to move toward happiness. Or if you're frightened, you can take your time and your friendly mind will say, okay, what are you really afraid of? Look at it closely. Don't go quickly through it. And then gradually your friendly mind will ask you, well, how do you move toward courage or how do you move toward safety so that you can guide yourself with very possible emphasis on very possible next few minutes, next hour. Friendly mind doesn't go into hours and hours and hours or days and days later. We're, we're alive now. So friendly mind is really designed to respond to the very near future or even in the moment when we most need it. Now, I'll give a quick example. When I was uh, 49, 21 years ago, I had a kidney transplant. And during that time, I had six years where I was in a certain kind of hell. And the first six months, I slept an hour a night for six months. So I was in a state of speed and exhaustion, stably, where I couldn't feel any good emotions at all. I, I couldn't feel gratitude. I couldn't feel love. I didn't even feel gratitude toward my brother that gave me the kidney. So really, that's where friendly mind and intention and wisdom came in because those parts weren't knocked out. It was just my, my ability to feel good feelings. I could, I could use, let's say, good intention and find some wisdom and use my will. But 
I wasn't able to feel good. So it really became critical and friendly mind you would think of, well, that's usually for when you have relatively superficial things, but it's particularly designed when you're really screwed. And when you know you have a friendly mind that's your ally inside you, you don't have a trouncing mind, you don't have a beat up mind, and you've been earning it. It is such an ally because every time you feel bad, it can be gradually like a Pavlovian response where you immediately say to yourself, okay, friendly mind, what do you have to say to me? And it says, well, I would suggest that you start off with trying to tolerate where you are. It's hard enough just to feel angry. It's hard enough just to feel frightened. And so start off settling there and then figure out the next step. And I'm going to be more patient than you can imagine. And it just helps guide you in that way. But, but the key kernel is we have to really listen to ourselves as a lifestyle so we learn to trust ourselves or else friendly, friendly mind will be kind of like putting frosting on garbage, which doesn't work very well. I mean, I, I love the thought about that. I also love when I was sick, I, I, I would, didn't have the concept of friendly mind. I, I wish I'd had it more than because I could have said, um, you know, gone to at least like, okay, I'm not feeling great. <laughs> like, you know, give me some compassion about how to even just get through. You know, I did have an, an intuitive place where I would go, just give me compassion to be kind <laughs> to, to other people. Like, but I didn't think about how I was talking to myself about the situation. And I think if I had had the, um, this friendly mind concept, then I would have been more gentle to me. Yeah. And, and, and in a way, obviously you were even ahead of the game to have an intuitive wanting to support yourself, intuitive wanting to support yourself, which is a lot more than most people have because the tendency when you're really, really feeling bad is for it to be a monopoly and not to have another side of yourself that wants to even look at yourself. And I see friendly mind as really being, not so much a concept as much as a, a key part of who we are. And when we develop it enough, it becomes more important than our feelings because we have our terrible feelings and we can't do anything about controlling them, which is uh, sort of bad news when you look at it realistically. How many times have you been able to, when you're really grieving, you have to wait it out. And when you're really terrified, and you're having some kind of medical issue or some kind of, uh, let's say, financial issue, then you sort of have to wait it out. But that doesn't mean you can't accompany yourself with another wiser, friendly part of you if you've generally have done the life work to be a good person and, and you have that basic trust where you feel deserving and you are deserving of the support and you certainly don't deserve blame because you're caught in certain feelings that everybody on the planet pretty much would be caught in. So that aspect of ourselves, when we start to really practice it for some years or decades, because it's not something that we just pick up as a concept and we understand it. Okay, now I got friendly mind and okay, friendly mind, what do you have to say? No, it's not that simple. It really develops uh, through practicing and repetitions. It's like playing a sport. You don't jump out of the golf course and play good golf right away. You, you, you really have to practice and, and uh, earn it. But when you've earned it, so many people have earned it, like you, who obviously have dedicated their lives to something good and yet might not have the specific realization that any moment you're feeling lousy, you can have another part of you that can ask a question of how can I support myself and then the friendly mind will kick in. And even if it takes a little while and I don't know, you're patient to say, okay, I'll keep asking. If it takes 10 minutes, 15 minutes. I'm going to keep asking because I don't have anything better to do. I mean, you know, I love working with our youth and, and I, I think, how can I support myself? Like that is just like one of just it's like it, like you said, it sounds like it's easy, but it's kind of like when you're starting to lift weights, you got to kind of, uh, you know, do it, uh, you know, and it gets a little bit lighter, but it's, it, it takes that constant repetitive commitment 
redoing, you know, and, and noticing when you're not doing it too. Like I, I love that part in the book where it's like you, you, you notice what your self-talk is. You may not even know what your self-talk is. Yeah. I, I think after a while in practicing friendly mind, the difference between friendly mind and irritated mind or uh, self, self-doubt mind is like black and white. But at first, the shades are much more blending and it's not that distinct. But when you really experience the alliance, it truly is like having your own best friend inside you. And it, it allows you to really lessen the panic that comes after a very difficult feeling. Oh my God, it's, how long am I going to have to go through this? And instead of that, what comes in is an insert that naturally, who doesn't want to ask, how can I take care of myself? You just have to remember one of the key things of friendly mind is to really stoke your memory and and realize, you know what? I have the ability to seize or seek what it is that would guide me, what, what, what it is that would help me, what it is that wouldn't really create more conflict with people around me. I love that. And I was just thinking like you could even write it on your mirror. So every morning you could, you see, how can I best support myself today? You know, that, that would be a mini ritual for me. How can I best support myself today? So it even just starts getting in my brain, no matter what, you know, how can, how can I bring, how can I, how can I be gentle with myself today? Could be another thing you could write on the mirror just to constantly remind you to be your best friend. Right. How can I, I, be my best friend. I spend more time by the refrigerator, so I like gold stars on the refrigerator. So, I mean, I, you, maybe you spend more time in the mirror, but, you know. Uh, of course I do. You know, yeah, yeah. I, I spend more time in the refrigerator looking at the outside wall. So. Well, you could have it on your refrigerator. That could exactly. Be so much How can I support myself on the refrigerator? Huh. Yeah, I, I just, I, I love that thought. And truthfully, as I, 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 I'm playing with this a little bit, but I do use it as a kind of a ritual. Like it's like a little ritual every day that when I start to see my mind go into like the dark hole, you know, that dark hole, especially with everything, I, I, I bring it back and say, okay, how can I be kind to myself right now? Or wow, Susan, how can you be gentle to yourself? That was a little <laughs> you know, over there today. Um, and so that to me that makes it makes me um, uh, have hope. Yeah. And you know what is particularly profound uh, because it's one of the great advantages potentially of aging that you have more decades of practice if you really put your attention to it. And I, I have found it at almost 72 that my life is easier because friendly mind is dominating my life pretty well with a lot of intermissions, um, you know, with, with human suffering, but they don't last as long. Yeah. And, and when they are lasting, they, they have a, a two caption picture, you know, they, they have the, the suffering picture and then they have the, uh, the, the person that's kind of putting, has a little bubble over their head asking the question. And then they start to merge into one picture uh, t- to various degrees, you know, obviously some things are harder to make any headway, but even if you don't make headway, even if you don't integrate the two captions, just knowing that a part of you wants to care for yourself is dedicated to care for yourself. Even if you're not able to feel it, at least your mind is sane. At least you have something that, that you can listen to and you can learn to listen to the to the friendly mind and respond to the friendly mind more than the feelings because when you're angry if you let your anger just keep spewing it's going to lead to a response whereas you can still be angry have a friendly mind it's going to say you know what it's probably not a very good idea it doesn't work out really well when i just dump my anger it doesn't work out really well when i just suppress my anger so what can I say that's still going to express what I need to say when I'm angry that isn't going to hurt me and isn't going to hurt the other person? I love so, it. So I love it. 
Robert, um, we're getting close to having, they're telling me it's time to take a break. So I, I would love for people to know more about what you do. Could you tell them how to get in touch with you or, or how to know about, I love your meditations on your, um, your awareness that heals. Uh, can you just give them a little bit about how they can know more sure. about you? Sure. There's awareness that heals.org uh, that actually has a free download. It has a lot of other things, but it has a free download of 75 emotions that are challenging and then 75 qualities that are healing. And I find that having that really lucid really helps in the confusion so that you can almost never say again, I feel bad, but I don't know what it is, or I'm wondering what I need. I love it. So if you want to know more about Robert after after the show, go to awareness that heals.org and go to the br global bridge.org, which is his foundation. And uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. And thank you so much for listening to Robert Stroke and Susan Huff at Living Your Gifts. Okay, all clear. Y'all ready to come back? All right, stand by. Welcome back, everyone. We've been speaking with Robert Strzok, author of Awareness That Heals and co-president of the Global Bridge Foundation. And we've been having a great conversation about healing your emotional pain. Robert, 
um, practical strategies of self-awareness and compassion both towards others and ourselves are worth looking more deeply into. Um, Robert, welcome back. Well, thank you. Um, slight tweak, which, I, which I'm a bit of a stickler on, which I'm sure you haven't noticed, no. uh, is that I never really believe uh, that more times than not that we heal our pain. It's more that we move toward healing our pain and that we appreciate that pain is natural and that it's our response to our pain that matters, not actually fully healing it. So I, I, never, I never believe in a get uh, well quick um, motto. I love that. And you're right. It, 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 it never goes away. It never stops. But we can keep yeah. moving forward. I mean, once in a while, somebody can pinch us, you know, and we can kind of get over the pinch. But... <laughs> And so there's, there's those kinds of pains, but I'm talking about the deeper existential pains or the deeper medical pains or whatever that can last for quite a long time. So you asked me a question early on of what, why I have such a hot button about spiritual teachers uh -huh. um, not sharing their current challenges. And to me, um, I'm guessing I'll be speaking to more students than teachers as we're speaking right now. So. I'll speak more to the students than to teachers, but when you look at the vast amount of compassion teachers, faith teachers, mindfulness teachers, uh, teachers that are really speaking in sort of a, a really caring, kind, uh, pardon the word monotone, um, but, but something that isn't really including them as human beings, isn't really saying, you know what, Last week I was angry, and according to my teachings, this is how, these are the processes I went through. I had to go through remembering to meditate, and then I needed to reflect, needed to ask a question. I talked to my wife, you know, something that that shows mindfulness. We aren't just compassion. We aren't just wisdom. We're a process. We're a human being, and then hopefully we're more than a human being. We have another part of us that wakes up and cares for ourselves and cares for others. And that being a active process is so inspiring because if we were just one, one dimension, obviously uh, there wouldn't be growth. We'd just be staying in the same zone. And for students, and as you're listening to this as a student, which we all are, which I am, uh, which you are too, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, I think you saw if they qualify as a student. Um, yeah. yeah. That when, when you're there, you know, and you're realizing that you don't want people to idealize you, if you're just compassion, if you're just mindfulness, if you're just faith, if you're just trust, if you're just love, then people start to feel like, well, gee, I want to be more like minister so-and-so or rabbi so-and-so or father so-and-so. And we always will compare ourselves rather than if they represent, this is what I have struggled through in this last recent past, not 20 years ago, but this is what I've struggled through this week. And this is how I dealt with it. Then we start to feel more normal. And we also feel inspired to use the tools that they're teaching us rather than the appearance that they're really beyond the human experience. So I really love Sabanfu's work. I love your work uh, because you easily come forward with the human side of you in such a authentic way that there's clearly something to work with and clearly you're devoted to do that. And that combination, I believe, is the most that we can hope for. Not this one dimensional uh, arrival at heaven. It, you know, I think that's one of the things that I loved about, especially her grief rituals, was that it was a place to just be really real and to shed the burdens and not to pretend or place, you know, <clears throat> or, or, or put yourself on a pedestal or whatever that may be that just doesn't work. And I think part of the reason why um, I was drawn to your book is that you were real and that uh, and and to to the way you 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 guide people at, at at being being able to feel what you feel, not ignoring the feeling, 
right? But not letting it grasp you. And um, and I I used to have a lot of conversations conversations with Sabonfu about like how after a ritual people would go home and and not always know how to in, incorporate the ritual in the everyday life. And and I think that awareness that heals gives you this. These ways to take what you've let go, what you're, or what you're trying to let go of, because it is always kind of a little circular, right? Um, to come back to like, how can I, how can I really take this ritual and ground it so I can keep moving into a healthier position? And and to me, that that's just um, such a gift for for myself, you know, to to practice that to really practice that so that people that I work with then can do it too and, and grow as I am with what your, what your teachings have been bringing to me. But I, you know, I, I wanted to talk about the tone of voice. You have a, a great part in there about the tone of voice. And I, I can remember, um, and I'll just say it. My mom, I was sick. My mom had a caregiver. I was trying really hard. She messed up with my mother. Um, I was trying real hard not to slam her, so I made sure I didn't cuss. You know, I made sure that that I didn't, um, you know, take a knife to her. And I said it, I thought, in a calm way. And my girlfriend said to me, you just killed that woman. <laughs> and honestly, I didn't know I did. I was like, what are you talking about? I didn't kill her. And then I went, oh, my gosh, I did. So when I read your part about the tone of voice, I thought, oh, it really, can you just expand on what that really means to really bring in that tone of voice? Yes. Um, tone of voice is, you know, perhaps the most obvious when you start to look at it, exposure of what might be classically and is classically called the subconscious. Because it conveys a message that we're feeling, but we're not necessarily aware we're feeling. Now, I had a mother as you know, as well, because I know you as well had that, who was a bit bitchy, uh, and she was devoted. She was a great mother, but I could always rely on a quarter of the time she would have a bitchy element, or irritated, or annoyed, or impatient, or intolerant, and. It was pretty evident to me that she had a problem even a young, at a young age that she was she was doing that towards something that that the crime was stronger than the, you know the punishment was stronger than the crime and so being aware of our own tone of voice really carefully and asking ourselves is this the quality that I want to convey is is it peaceful is it strong is it soft? Is it empathic? Is it kind? And looking at the situation and saying to yourself, okay, I'm with this person and let's assume there's some kind of conflict. And you're saying, uh oh, if I just react in a tone of voice, I'm just going to be echoing the same kind of tone that I got back. And so being able to have that contemplative space, that pause, where we're asking ourselves, okay, what do I really want to convey, not only in tone, but also in words? What's the message that really would not be full of crap where I'm just throwing frosting at, in their face, um, but where I'm saying, like, for example, you, you unquestionably could have been said to your caregiver, you know, I, I'm a little concerned about this, this, and this. And I'm wondering if you feel it makes sense for you to be more like this, this, and that. And your tone of voice would probably just be even. You wouldn't be gushing, you know, something that was very, very nice. You, 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 you would be expressing something. <laughs> You'd be expressing something that would be probably more even in tone, but would be directive. It would have a certain amount of strength. It would show that you were caring, that you were rooting for them, but you were also very protective of your mother. And, you know, I, I remember many, many times saying to my mother and my first reaction, if I didn't pause, I would say, you know, why are you bitching at me? You know, and, and, and I would pause and I would say, mom, you know, can you, 
express that in a different way, please. I mean, that it's, it's not going to be helpful if I feel like you're punishing me trying to teach me a lesson. You know, you may notice it in our lives as students of life. It doesn't work out very well when we look at the amount of times that we've had anger or impatience and tolerance with somebody we're with, there's a pretty good chance we're either going to get the same thing back or a withdrawal or an avoidance, you know, master-slave kind of relationship that we're entering into. And maybe there's a few of us out there that like master-slave relationships, but I don't think the majority of us really want that. No, and, and, and I think... For me, the pausing comes when I think, oh, I'm going to, I want to get defensive. Yeah. Mm, yeah. What's underneath the, the defensiveness, you know? Right, right. And so when you're aware that the instinct, the gut level feeling, which is highly overrated, you know, one of my favorite sayings is when you're feeling good, you can go with your gut level feeling. But when you're feeling bad, always follow your, your, friendly mind, your wisdom, and let that guide your tone of voice. Don't follow your feelings. Follow your feelings is, you're a nutcase if you follow your feelings and you feel bad. You know, and, and I don't mean that in a pejorative way, but you'll, you're going to reinforce the nuttiness of both of you. And so that contemplation of asking yourself, you know, not first you might ask a question like, what do I feel like saying? And then you realize, no, that one's not going to quite do it because that means it's going to be barf, barf, um, or bark, bark. Um, and <laughs> and so in, instead of that, you really want to go to, what do I really want to convey that actually isn't going to create harm at the, be- at the worst? And maybe what do I want to say that might have a chance of implementing benefit? And it's not like you're being a nice person and you're, you're, uh, just being nice to them and not being nice to yourself, the tone can take care of both of you. And the idea and the ideal is to have a tone that's really going to take care of your needs and their needs. And when you're not clear what tone you want to convey, again, you can go to those lists that are on on awarenessthatheals.org that are free that will identify the 75 emotional qualities or emotional feelings that will come through in tones, it won't be hard to figure out what it is, and then the qualities that you really want to move toward. Um, And so it really can be very helpful to be more literate of what it is you're feeling and what it is you really want to convey to take care of everyone in the situation. Well, I wish our politics were doing more of that, you know? Yeah, I wish our politics not only were doing that, but I wish our politics had been doing that for the, fa- for the past thousands of years because the powerful have had an endless tendency to feel entitled, to feel arrogant, uh, to uh, speak in a way that's derogatory. And that's a big thing. It's a humongous thing. It's, a, it's the fastest way to create war, alienation, distrust, dishonoring, and really to convey with a tone of voice that's saying, I do want to contemplate how we can get along and make the best of the fact that we're very different in our philosophies, but we don't want to hurt each other. If we hurt each other, the other one's going to hurt the other. So if we can see that and we can focus on friendly mind, if we can focus on tone of voice, if we can focus on a little bit of contemplation, and a little bit of wisdom. That would be such a guidance for our politicians or our corporate leaders. Not so much our religious and spiritual teachers. Most of them have a nice tone of voice. They just don't deal with the the subconscious challenges they're dealing with. Well, well, and I, I also think just even in our families, I mean, right now, like there's so, there's so much diversity and like, how do you talk to your, your, your family members that aren't in alignment with your political views, uh, you know, and, or my friends, you know, like, and not wanting to just go at them like, what, you don't see like me and, and, and trying to find that bridge. It, it's not easy right now. I mean, 
I mean, I, I can feel so crazy in my head and think such horrible, horrific thoughts that how do you then call, I mean, give me, give me some techniques, Robert, on how to like breathe into that and be able to speak and maybe find some bridge of how to open up a, a healthier communication. Yeah. I think when you say even our families, you may even say, especially our families for, for a lot of us, not, not even. But I think the developing of practices like breathing and just lying down in bed, putting our hand on our hearts and conveying to ourselves, you know, I feel better when I'm moving toward more goodness. So I want to breathe and ask for help. And whether you believe in a God or whether you believe in a friend or you believe in an ancestor or you believe, you believe in Jesus or, or, or Buddha or whoever you believe in, you're asking for help for goodness to come through you because you know intuitively, especially if you contemplate, that if you just simply react in life, the quality of life is going to suck. And, and so this quality and inquiry this asking of yourself how do i find a place inside me and it's almost like you're sending a message to your vocal cords and you and your vocal cords are becoming chummy and and you're, and you're sending a message to the vocal cords and and you know they're musical instruments and and you're saying to them hey can you help me out here i th i feel like i want to go twang but I'd like to go bing. And I don't want to go bing too much to where I'm so nice. I, I, I'm just uh, going to be speaking way over everybody's head. I want to be sincere. I really want to find the quality that is going to be of benefit. For some people, it's going to be through prayer. For some people, it's going to be through meditation. But again, there's, there's no shortcut as to how you can reach that tone of voice because it's not cosmetic. It's not just a push a button and then the ventriloquist is going to come through your chest and you're going to manifest a, a better tone of voice. You have to slow down and you need to, you need to really ask and remember that you want to care because the, the key is kind of like when I mentioned quality of life, you, you it has to come from your own wanting. And your own wanting isn't going to want to care unless you do a lot of contemplation because our society is programmed not so much to care, but to succeed and to uh, be popular and to have power and to be sexy and to be young. And so this is sort of a certain kind of uncommon common sense that we can see that well, those other things are good things. It's nice to succeed. It's nice to be able to take care of yourself. Uh, but it's even nicer if we know, and nice isn't the right word, it's e even more fulfilling. If we trust our heart and we w know we want to trust others' hearts and our life is devoted to it, that alone gives a sense of purpose and meaning and gives the chances of us being fulfilled in life overwhelmingly higher percentages. I just wish that it was in, it, we were educating our children more around that. You know, I, I really feel like if we could teach this to the younger, you know, what, what a blessing that could be that all along they're just kind of moving, moving in that, that aspect of having a kinder heart to themselves and a kinder heart to everybody. I mean, I just, I think it's a message that needs to be um, spread all over because uh, that friendly mind and that being friendly to yourself is so valuable, Robert. It, it's really um, helped me have a language that I, it, like a speak a new language that I wasn't able to speak before with such clarity. Um, and I, I really want you to, I, I'm going to make you plug yourself again and tell people how to find out more and how to get your book and, and all of that, because it, it's, it's, it's worth really putting these techniques to practice. 
Yeah. Well, f- first I'll talk about what you said, which is, you know, one of my greater passions, which is this should be in kindergarten, elementary school, sixth grade, ninth grade, 12th grade. It should be in every section of education. And I have two grandkids and they understand what a, what a bully is and what it is to not be nice and what it is to be nice. They, they used to know before COVID um, what it was like to be when somebody said, come here, sweetheart, or, or come here, sweetheart. Um, and they know, they know when they're, they're hear, hearing that tone of voice. And if they were educated to say, mommy, could you speak a little nicer to me? Or daddy, could you speak a little nicer to me? Or person in the sandbox, could you speak a little nicer to me? And if they had those tools and understood the paradoxical power, which basically means love, uh, that each of us has, it would, it would set the world up to have such an optimistic future. And it really should be in college. It should be in, the, in PhD programs in psychology. Tone of voice and friendly mind are just concepts that we all need to be able to be fulfilled in daily life. And it's not, let's just say, obvious, but it is intuitive if we go quieter. So, and there wouldn't be as many divorces either. Yeah, I, I don't, there wouldn't be as many divorces. Um, there may be a few quicker ones. <laughs> my, my grandparents lived for 67 years and they didn't have a day where they were happy. Um, on the other side, I had 60 years where they were happy all the time. So it wasn't just bad news. But, but yes, for couples that are really trying and really want to get along and they can't find the tools, certainly it would help marriage and friendships and family relationships uh, and, and being able to just express what your heart really wants to express, not what your emotions and your reactions want to receive want to express and being a response to our feelings rather than identifying and expressing more our feelings is really gold and by a response I mean we're asking what tone of voice do we want to have we're asking what quality do I want to convey we're asking what would it be wise for my mind to express that would benefit everybody, or at least give a chance of benefiting everybody, or at least not creating harm to everybody. So yeah, all of that would be, I believe, very, very helpful. Um, I, 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 truly. Yeah. I mean, I've been counseling now to age myself for 50 years, and it is so fun. It is so enjoyable to develop love and to have receptive clients that know they want to be more loving. They want to be more caring, not loving in the sense that I'm going to love you and I don't care that you love about you love me or not learning about mutual love and learning about love that then maybe even goes beyond friends into the world and maybe deals with some of the tremendous uh, dangers that the world and the country are facing and getting involved and recognizing as you say so well, that each person can find their unique gifts and guiding them to those unique gifts is such a blessing and such a different kind of orientation in life, you know, absorbing some of the wisdom from some of the great tribes in Africa like you have and and various other Aboriginal tribes throughout the world. I mean, I, I just think our children need it I need it, you know, we all, we, our country needs it, you know, and, and we need to find a way that it's not just so singular about ourselves either, and that it's being of service, and how can you serve, and how can you bring that service out in a way that people actually hear the truth behind it, you know, and, and, and the, that there, if we do from this loving place, start to acknowledge that more inside of ourselves in our inner world, then I think it can translate into the outer world, which is what you talk about. And we're getting really close to the end here. So um, 
I just, I just want to say, I really want you to tell people how to get your book and, and how to, to really uh, start incorporating that in a different way through your meditation. So let them know about uh, more about how they can reach out and find out more. Okay. Oh, awarenessthatheals.org has the most comprehensive uh, reflection of the book and the globalbridge.org has the most comprehensive work in the outer world where we're working with homelessness and we're working with regenerative farming and we're, wor and we're working with economic inequality and global warming and immigration reform. So all of those things are there. But if there's one thing that I really hope that the listener really takes in is that it's a gift to be able to ask yourself, what is it I'm really feeling and being able to identify what that feeling is. And again, there are those 75 free identifiers that you can use if you're confused. 